So also welcome back from me to all of you to our talk on eternal duration and moments in time. <clears throat> At the 1988 Summer Olympics held in Seoul in South Korea, thank you. Whitney Houston sang one of her most beautiful songs at the opening ceremony. Give me one moment in time when I'm more than I thought I could be, when all my dreams are heartbeat away and all the answers up to me. Give me one moment in time when I'm racing with destiny. But what is the nature of time? It seems to be moving in a very precise order of seconds, minutes, and hours, and around which our life is organized. We take it for granted. But its mystery has challenged philosophers and scientists alike. Both agree that it is a deception of our senses. It cannot be emphasized and repeated enough. Theosophy teaches that the ancient secret doctrine about the mystery of cosmos, nature, and man is the accumulated wisdom of the ages, that its mysterious symbolism is all recorded on a few pages of geometrical signs and glyphs. According to an uninterrupted record of men who had developed and perfected their physical mental, psychic, and spiritual organizations to the utmost possible degree. That no vision of one of these adepts was accepted till it was checked, confirmed by the visions so obtained as to stand as independent evidence of other adepts and by centuries of experience. And the Mahachowan, a Sanskrit term for the chief of a spiritual hierarchy or the head of the Transimalian mystics or adepts to which Mahatma Kutumi and Moria belonged, wrote that the doctrine we promulgate must become ultimately triumphant, like every other truth, enforcing its theories with direct inference deduced from and corroborated by the evidence furnished by modern exact science. So what has theosophy or the divine wisdom teach us about time? And what has modern exact science found out about it by now? Very poetically expressed, time moves on with noiseless, incessant steps through aeons and ages. But time is only an illusion produced by the succession of our states of consciousness as we travel through eternal duration, says the secret doctrine. And it does not exist when no consciousness exists in which the illusion can be produced, but it lies asleep. The present is only a hypothetical mathematical line which divides that part of eternal duration which we call the future from that part which we call the past. Nothing on earth is real, has real duration, for nothing remains without change or the same for a billionth part of a second. And the sensation we have the, of the actuality of the division of time known as present comes from the blurring of that momentary glimpse or succession of glimpses of things that our senses give us. As those things pass from the region of ideals, which we call the future, to the regions of memories that we name the past. The real person or thing does not exist solely of what is seen at any particular moment, but is composed of the sum of all its various and changing conditions from its appearance in the material form to its disappearance from the earth. It is these sum totals that exist from eternity in the future and pass by degrees through matter to exist for eternity in the past. No one could say that a bar of metal dropped into the sea came into existence as it left the air and ceased to exist as it entered the water. 
and that the bar itself consisted only of that cross-section thereof, which at any given moment coincided with the mathematical plane that separates, and at the same time the atmosphere and the ocean. Even so of persons and things, which, dropping out of the to be into the has been, out of the future into the past, present momentarily to our senses as a cross-section, as it were, of their total selves as they pass from one time and space or matter on their way from one eternity to another. And these two constitute that duration in which alone anything has true existence, where our sense is but able to recognize it as a secret doctrine. Our conceptions, limited to the narrow area of our experience, attempt to fit it for an end, at least the beginning of time and space. But neither of these exist in reality. For in such a case, potential time would not be eternal or space boundless. The past no more exists than the future, only our memories survive. And our memories are but the glimpses that we catch of the reflections of this past in the currents of the astral light, as a psychometer catches them from the astral emanations of the objects held by him. There is but one indivisible, indivisible and absolute omniscience and intelligence in the universe, that's the secret doctrine. And this thrills through every atom and infinitesimal point of the whole finite cosmos, which has no bounds and which people call space, considered independently of anything contained in it. Cosmos, spelled with a K, was used by HPB in the sense of the Manvantaric or active manifestation as a whole. She often applies the adjective cosmic with a C to the phenomenon of the solar system and speaks of that system as a cosmos and the universe. Unfortunately, this distinction was constantly missed out by proofreaders, say the editors of the Collected Writings 12. And we meet the term cosmos applied to the solar system where it should have been written cosmos. The same method is used when talking about Greek, Greek mythology, where chronos stands for endless immovable duration, without beginning, without an end, beyond divided time and beyond space. And chronos is represented as mutilating Uranus, his father, the meaning of this mutilation is very simple. Absolute time is made to become the finite and the conditions. A portion is robbed from the whole, thus showing that Saturn, the father of the gods, has been transformed from eternal duration into a limitless period. Kronos, of finite time, spelled with a C, cuts down with the skies even the longest and to us seemingly endless cycles, limited in eternity, and puts down with the same skies the mightiest rebels. Not one will escape the skies of time. That skies will be made to tremble one millionth of a second in its ascending or descending course. Plato's etymological definition of the word theos, for example, derives from the verb to move, as suggested by the motion of the heavenly bodies which he connects with deity. According to the esoteric philosophy, this deity is during its nights and its days, or its cycles of rest and activity, the eternal perpetual motion the ever-becoming as well as the ever-universally present and the ever-existing. It is a perpetual, never-ceasing evolution, circling back in its incessant progress through eons of duration into its original status, absolute unity. According to Eastern philosophy, the indivisible, in its passive, unmanifested form, divides boundless duration into unconditionally eternal and universal time, 
and the condition one called Kandaka or in Sanskrit. One is the abstraction or noumenon of infinite time, Kala. The other is the phenomenon appearing periodically as the effect of Mahat, the universal intelligence, limited by momentaric duration. Duration has always potential time in it. Duration is eternal time, which had neither beginning nor end. Time is already something. And that is why they say in Eastern philosophy, time is the son of duration, its child. Though the whole cosmos is a gigantic chronometer in one sense, says Mahatma Kutumi, we mortals do not make any take much, if any, cognizance of time during periods of happiness and bliss and find them ever too short. I may also remind you in this connection that time is something created entirely by ourselves, that while a short second of intense agony may appear as an eternity to one man, to another more fortunate, hours, days, and sometimes whole years may seem to flit like one brief moment. And that finally, of all the sentient and conscious beings on earth, man is the only animal that takes any cognizance of time, although it makes him neither happier nor wiser. Finite similes are unfit to express the abstract and the infinite, nor can the objective ever mirror the subjective. The secret doctrine tells us further that evolution is commenced by the intellectual energy of the Logos, not merely on account of the potentialities locked up in Mula Prakriti, which is the feminine principle of Parabrahma root nature. The light of the Logos is a link between objective matter and subjective thought. It is thought, the essence of cosmic electricity the one instrument with which, with which the Logos works. The Greek term Logos was with every nation and people the manifested deity, or the effect of a cause which is ever concealed. Thus speech is a Logos of thought and translated as a verb or word, manifesting through vibrations of sound in the metaphysical sense. It also symbolizes reason etymologically. Logos is identical with Akasha, the subtle, supersensual spiritual essence which pervades all space and in which lies the inherent eternal radiation of the universe in its ever-changing aspects on the planes of matter and objectivity. Akasha has but one attribute, sound, which is a translated symbol of Logos or speech in its mystic sense. In a booklet, Reflections on Time, Duration, and Immortality, Yancey Hoskins, who was national president when I joined the TS in 1991, refers to the Gospel according to St. John, which opens with the familiar words, In the beginning was the word, or logos in the Greek text. But she adds that she had come across a new English Bible, which starts with a significant difference where it says, when all things began, the word already was, which means that nothing had started from nothing, but everything is always there in its potentiality. The secret doctrine confirms the absolute law of periodicity, like flux and reflux, ebb and flow, day and night, life and death, which physical science has observed in all departments of nature. What is light but the world illuminating and life-giving deity? Light is time. What from an abstraction has become a reality. If there were no light, you would not have time. The melded or mixed nature of space and time is intimately woven with the properties of light speed. The inviolable nature of the speed of light is actually in Einstein's hand talking about the inviolable nature of cause and effect 
confirms Brian Greene, an American theoretical physicist, mathematician, and string theorist, professor at Columbia University in New York. In an article for the New York Times called The Time We Thought We Knew, he wrote, The time dominates experience. We live by watch and calendar. We spend billions of dollars to conceal time's bodily influences and uproariously celebrate particular moments in time, even as we quietly despair of his passage. But what is time, he asks. Certainly a few years into the 21st century, science must have figured out what time seems to flow, why it always goes in one direction, and why we are uniformly drawn from one second to the next. But the fact is that the explanations for these basic features of time remain controversial. The more physicists have searched for definitive answers, the more our everyday conception of time appears illusory. According to Isaac Newton, writing in the 17th century, time flows equally without reference to anything external meaning that the universe is equipped with a kind of built-in clock that ticks off second identically, regardless of location or epoch. This is an intuitive perception of time. No wonder that Newton's words had sway for more than 200 years. But at the early part of the 20th century, Albert Einstein saw through nature's Newtonian facade and revealed that the passage of time depends on circumstances and environment. He showed that the wristwatches worn by two individuals moving relative to one another or experience different gravitational fields tick off time at different states. Numerous terrestrial experiments and astronomical observations leave no doubt that Einstein was right because the flexibility of time's passage becomes readily apparent only at high speeds, near the maximum speed of light, which is about 186,282 miles per second. Or in strong gravitational fields, near black holes, for example, which remains still a great challenge even for physicists to internalize Einstein's breakthrough for more than 100 years ago. Were we to board a spaceship heading out from Earth at almost 100% of light speed, travel for six months and then head back home at the same speed, and your motion would slow your clock again relative to that who remained stationary on Earth, you would be one year older upon your return, while everybody on Earth would have raised 7,000 years, says Professor Green. Most of us imagine that reality consists of everything that exists right now, that everything would be found like a hypothetical freeze-frame image of the universe at this time, that the history of reality could thus be depicted by stacking one such freeze-frame image on top of the one that came before, creating a cosmic version of an old-time flipbook, a remnant of Newton's absolute thinking. But clocks that are in relative motion or that are subject to different gravitational fields tick off time at different rates. Individuals carrying such clocks will not therefore agree on what happens when on the different pages of the cosmic flipbook, even though it provides an equally valid companion of history. Under these rules, What constitutes a moment in time is completely subjective. Sitting next to each other, our freeze-frame image of the present would be identical. But as soon as one of us were to start walking, the mathematics of relativity shows that the subsequent pages of the flipbook would have happened at different times, some earlier, some later. Even ordinary motion, when considered over vast distances, results in a marked change in our perception of reality. 
revealing how thoroughly subjective the temporal categories of past, present, and future actually are. This realization shatters our comfortable sense that the past is gone, the future is yet to be, and the present, if us truly exist. This is what the Mahatma Tumi means when he says in letter 15, only the progress one makes in the study of arcane knowledge from its rudimental elements brings him gradually to understand our meaning. Only thus and not otherwise does it strengthening and refining those mysterious links of sympathy between intelligent men. The temporary isolated fragments of the universal soul and the cosmic soul itself brings them into full rapport. Once this is established, then only will this awakened sympathy serve indeed to connect man with, or for the want of a European scientific word more competent to express the idea, I'm again compelled to describe as an energetic chain which binds together the material and immaterial cosmos, past, present, and future, and quickens his perception as to clearly grasp not merely all things of matter, but of spirit also. I feel even irritated at having to use these three clumsy words, past, present, and future, says the Mahatma miserable concepts of the objective phases of the subjective whole. They are about as ill-adapted for the purpose as an axe for fine carving. In quantum mechanics, the tremendously successful theory of atoms and subatomic particles is taken into account. The challenge becomes greater still, says Professor Green because quantum mechanics has at its core the uncertainty principle, which establishes a limit on how precisely particular features of the micro-world can be simultaneously measured. The more precise the measurement of a particle's position is, the more wildly uncertain its velocity becomes. For subatomic particles, these fluctuations are well understood mathematically and have been precisely documented experimentally. But when it comes to time and space, quantum fluctuations so mangle space and time that the conventional ideas of light and light, left and right, backward, forward, up and down, before and after, become meaningless. Scientists are still struggling to understand these implications. But many agree that just a percentage in political polls are average. Conventional notions of time and space are also average. Many believe this will involve a radically new formulation of na natural law, where the matrix of space-time within which they have worked for centuries has to be traded for a more basic realm that is devoid of time and space. This perplexing idea poses a substantial challenge to leading researchers. Yet as liquid water, H2O, emerges from an enormous number of particular combinations of molecules, time and space as we know them would emerge from a particular combination of some more basic, though still unidentified entities. Time and space would then be rendered secondary, that emerge only in suitable condition in the aftermath of the Big Bang, for example, says Professor Green. And the secret doctrine commentaries say, there's neither space nor time when the first thing appears, says HPB. It is all in space and time once it is differentiated, just confirming Professor Green's hypothesis of time and space at secondary. And that space as an abstraction is endless, but in its concreteness and limitation, space becomes a representation of something. That is what the ancients called deity. Most physicists cope with this disparity, writes Professor Green, that there is time understood scientifically, 
and that as time has experienced intuitively. The choice of whether to be fully seduced by the faith nature reveals directly to our senses or to also recognize the reality that exists beyond perception is ours. So what happens when science and occultism meet? Dr. Tamini was a professor of chemistry in the Allahabad University in India and an influential scholar in the fields of yoga and Indian philosophy. He was also a leader of the Theosophical Society. Professor Tamini authored a number of books on Eastern philosophy, including a modern interpretation of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. In his book, Science and Occultism, he wrote, that according to occultism, discontinuity is introduced in the realm of space by bringing into existence an infinite number of points, each of which serves as a center of separation and distinction from the whole. Since manifestation can take place only through the great point, the precipitation of an infinite number of points is only possible by the reproduction or proliferation of the great point. As an infinite number of points, when put very closely together, can give an illusory impression of a continuous line, which can also be produced by the rapid movement of a point. So an infinite number of points or rapid movements of points can produce by different combinations an illusory impression of objects in a different number of dimensions. Scientific knowledge fully corroborates this occult doctrine, he says. For the apparently solid object with continuous surfaces are nothing but aggregates of atoms and other subatomic particles separated from another by vast distances. This is also how the images on a television, computer, or a prints work. If you ever looked at a television screen close up, you will have noticed that the picture is made up of millions of tiny colored dots or squares called pixels. Laptop LCD computer screen also make up seven images using pixels although they are much too small to see. In a television or computer screen, electronic equipment switches all this colored pixel on and off very quickly. Light from the screen travels out to your eyes, and your brain is fooled into seeing a large moving picture. Like space, time is also continuous in the integrated state of consciousness, and thus incapable of reducing the phenomena of time, says Professor Timely. It must be broken up in instants, or the smallest possible periods of particles of time, which are called xana in Sanskrit. It is these discrete periods or ideal points of time which underlie all kinds of changes in the spatial impressions of the flow of time in consciousness. Quoting from the Oxford Dictionary, when instant is defined as a moment or a point in time. Professor Timely gives also the example of breaking up the continuity of time in producing a continuous coherent phenomena by projecting a cinematographic picture on the screen, similar to the flipbook of Professor Green. Without the mechanism of periods of darkness intermittently, Breaking up the continuity of time, a blur instead of a clear picture would be produced. These points of time and space lie at the basic of the form side of the manifested universe, and together they produce all the illusory impressions of the phenomenal world. Time is nothing but the impression produced in consciousness by the change of mental images in manifestation. Wherever there is movement, time is always associated with it. Movement is always measured in terms of time unit in all scientific work. Whenever there is change, time comes in inevitably, 
so much so that there's no way of perceiving or measuring time except through changes in the objects in our environment, says Professor Timely. In the teachings of the Vedas and Brahmanism, we we can find the most ancient concept of life in the universe, where the rhythmic cosmic cycles of activity called Manvantara and rest called Pralaya in Sanskrit repeating themselves eternally in space. These cycles, as we have learned, are specified as the days and nights of Brahma. The active periods are called kalpa or aeons, divided by shorter intervals called yugas, of immense time spans which the human brain staggers to comprehend. What is the reason for these eternal periods of activity and rest other than an evolutionary process of optimizing consciousness through every form of existence, finally culminating in man up to highest level of universal love for all beings, realizing that life is all one and interconnected at its root level? Everything that is, was, and will be eternally is. Even the countless forms which are finite and perishable only in their objective, not in their ideal form. They exist as ideas in the eternity and, when they pass away, will exist as reflections. Neither the form of man nor that of any animal, plant, or stone has ever been created. And it is only on this plane of ours that it's commenced becoming, that is objectivizing into its present materiality, or expanding from within outwards, from the most sublimated and supersensuous essence into its grossest appearance. Therefore, our human forms had existed in the eternity as astral or ethereal prototypes. As long as we keep identifying ourselves with physical form of our body, forgetting that we are a spark of the Absolute or Brahma, or what the Mahatma Kutumi calls the temporarily isolated fragments of the universal soul and the cosmic soul itself, going through an evolutionary process of broadening and optimizing our conscious awareness on all levels of being, suffering is unavoidable since we are caught in the effects of the causes we are producing ourselves, which is called karma in Eastern mysticism. In the midst of all this suffering, Buddha appeared some two and a half thousand years ago to find a way out of it by his own self-effort. His self-awakening as a young age is beautifully described in poetry by Sir Edwin Arnold in his book, The Light of Asia. When his father wanted to show him one year the beauty of spring in nature, the prince rejoiced. But then he looked deeper and noticed all the thorns which grew on the rose of life, how peasants sweated for their hard work as well as the oxen through the flaming hours of the day, that lizard fed on ants and the snake ate him is covering a long chain of eating and being eaten by another creature. It was a life living on death. The vast show of nature revealed to him a grim conspiracy of mutual murder. He was terribly shocked by this discovery. Sent everyone away to be alone and deeply meditated on what he had witnessed. In his book, The Living Buddha, Dr. Edmund Rodriguez gives us a good overview of Buddha's life and his teachings on how to overcome the mis- misery of life. Dr. Chikli earned his PhD from the University of Paris, as well as other degrees from the universities of Leipzig and Vienna, and had a professorship of philosophy and experimental psychology at the University of Cluj in Romania was a well-known philologist in Sanskrit, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. His most important translations were the Aramaic texts of the Gospel of Peace by Jesus Christ and other Essene scriptures, 
which he found in the archives of the Vatican in the 1920s, made possible through his headmaster, who was a very good friend of the librarian at that time. In one of his lectures, Dr. Chikli also mentions the Vedas and the Brahmanic system of ancient India as one of the most ancient concepts of life in the universe. The eternal rhythmic cosmic cycles of days and nights of Brahma, representing the idea that there is no creation, that everything exists eternally as ideas and manifests in cycles, in an ever-improving process of evolution just as the earthly days and nights are but reflections of the cosmic days and nights, so are the human cycles of light. Buddhism and Gautama's Four Noble Truths concerning suffering and its elimination is still the most dynamic force in all Asia, he says. What he calls the ocean of suffering has two reasons, which are as prominent today as they were some thousands of years ago. Avidya, or ignorance of the true nature of our being, produced by the illusion of our senses, and Tana, the thirst for physical life on this earth, because we have forgotten what our true essence is. When we are ignorant of the law of cause and effect or karma, we continuously violate it, creating unwanted causes and effects carrying us endlessly through the perpetual ocean of suffering, which Buddha called samsara, or the wheel of life. Tana is the thirst for the wrong kind of pleasures, thirst for the pseudo-values of life, thirst for all those things which are harmful to us, robbing us of our physical health and peace of mind. To conquer avidya or ignorance, we need the wisdom of karma or the law of cause and effect by replacing the wrong pleasures of life with the real values of a natural, simple, and peaceful life. We can conquer the two causes of suffering, ignorance and thirst for physical existence. For Buddha, the most important thing in life was not metaphysical speculation, but to remedy suffering right here and now. According to Buddha, the whole world is burning in flames of destruction, violence, ignorance, intolerance, and persecution, which is still true today, as it was two and a half thousand years ago. In a sermon in Deer Park at Benares, he chose a meaningful symbol of a wheel, whose outer perimeter symbolized the eternal circuit of things, moving continuously, and the eight spokes represented the noble eightfold path, leading to the central point of the wheel, the only point that is permanent, leading to nirvana, a state of absolute existence and consciousness, when the ego of man is absorbed again in its true spiritual essence but still preserving individuality, still being able to help suffering humanity and nature. The preconditions of arriving at this goal are laid down in the Eightfold Noble Truths, symbolized by the Eight Spokes. First, the division of wisdom, right understanding, right thought, the division of ethical conduct, right speech, right action, like livelihood, the duration of mental discipline, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. According to the philosophy of Buddha, the world is, the universe is a world of phenomena in which everything is in motion. This is also confirmed by the Mahatma Kutumi that the universal perpetual emotion which never ceases, never slackens nor increases its speed, not even during the interludes between the pralayas or nights of Brahma, is the only eternal un and uncreated deity we are able to recognize. The basic character of samsara is 
that it consists of things that appear and disappear. But the basic character of nirvana always is being the absolute state of absolute existence and absolute consciousness into which the ego of man merges after reaching the highest degree of perfection and holiness during life. Nirvana does not appear or disappear, for it does not exist in space and time. For this reason, it was symbolized by the point in the center of the wheel around which all things turn, but which itself is stable. A further evolution of the symbolism of the wheel of life took place when a figure of man was added. He was shown as standing with his feet on the circumference of the wheel and with his head at the central point. This symbolized man enmeshed in the moving wheel, but he himself remains without moving. It represents that although man is connected with samsara, with all the forces running through him, he can also walk on the eightfold noble path of truth, symbolized by the eight spokes. And then all the positive and creative forces in life, which are in harmony with the Dharma or the cosmic law, flow through him. And the point in the center of the man's forehead coincides with the central point of the wheel of life, and there is no more running around chased by Tana, the thirst for physical life. The noble truth of the Eightfold Path will lead him there. There are scientists today who speak openly about the illusion of time from their own experiences at higher levels of consciousness, during meditation, for example, near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences, like in the writings of Dr. Valerie Hunt, who was professor of physiological sciences at the University College in Los Angeles, or Dr. Edgar Mitchell, astronaut and six men walking on the moon. I have chosen one example from Dr. Eben Alexander, an American neurosurgeon who, was, who has worked at Duke University Medical Center, Harvard Medical Center, University of Massachusetts Medical Center, and other hospitals, and is a member of the American Board of Neurological Surgery and the American College of Surgeons. In 2008, he very suddenly collapsed with a fatal form of bacterial meningitis and was in a coma for about a week, with just 2% of survival. But he gained consciousness again against all the odds and the amazement of his medical colleagues who looked after him. During the three years that have elapsed since then, he has written several books about his near-death experience and has shared many forums on this subject with people who had similar experiences. After reading Dr. Alexander's book, Proof of Heaven, the Dalai Lama invited him to join him for a public discussion of modern scientific views on reincarnation. The discussion was part of the graduation ceremony for Maitripa College, a Tibetan Buddhist school and meditation center in Portland, Oregon. The Dalai Lama spoke last. His subject were the different types of phenomena that influence our view. First, evident phenomena, which can be studied by direct observation. Second, hidden phenomena, which can be inferred by observed phenomena and reason. And third, extremely hidden phenomena, which can be accessed only through our own first-person experience or inference about the trustworthy testimony of someone else. Dr. Eben Alexander's near-death experience falls, of course, under the third category. Before his coma, he had heard many tales from his patients suggestive of after-death communications, but he'd always filed them away as fantasies of wishful thinking until he had his own experience while in a coma. About time, Dr. Alexander writes, we must presume that something as primordial as time is well worked out in our conventional scientific worldview. But nothing could be further from the truth. 
Not only physical matter is not what it appears to be, but neither is time. Major clues exist in the apparent passage of time or not, including dreams under general anesthesia, during a death experiences and in other altered states of consciousness. But time in these states of altered conscious awareness can be very different. Time can seem to go forward and backward, can run faster or slower than Earth's time. In his coma, Dr. Alexander experienced the flow of time in the physical universe as wrapped into a tight loop or even a, a point, becoming aware of the more fundamental form of causality, manifested in what he calls deep time, which is primarily related to the evolution of consciousness and the myriads of events in the lives of sentient beings. A steadily flowing river of earth time was shown to be an illusion promoted by our consciousness on this side of the veil. Compared with deep time, apparent earth time is only a subset related to our shared sense of reality in which our collective consciousness is witnessing the same group reality. Consciousness in alternate dimensions is not limited to Earth time and has access to reasons outside of consensus reality with these. But unfortunately, even giving our cognitive acknowledgement of the supreme illusion, we are still drawn into its seductive and irresistible power, says Dr. Alexander. When Buddha was dying, and his disciples started to cry around him. He said to them, If you are crying, you do not understand my teaching. You have the Dharma. You have the teaching. And his last words were, Strive incessantly. And to close with some wise words by Mark Twain, the two, the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. Peace be with you. Thank you. <laughs>